So the first idea is, um, so today there was enough talk about n-gram models, so we can basically just produce the output one word at a time and condition then each word based on the previous word. So we start with a, what's the probability that we're gonna start the translation with i, and then want, conditioned that we just produced the word i, and then two, conditioned that I produced i want so far. So this now looks pretty solid. It has one major flaw, it's not conditioned on the input at all, so it just produces an English string without any actually connection to the Portuguese. Um, so what's the, how are we gonna get the Portuguese in? So the one idea is to just put it also in the conditioning context. So we're gonna produce the word i, given that that is our Portuguese string. And then when we produce the word want, we also condition on i and the entire Portuguese string. Um, so that's gonna be a bit hard to estimate. So if you just think about probability distributions as learned from data, how often, if you haven't seen the, the sentence in your training data at all, you actually have absolutely no statistics whatsoever to estimate probability distributions. So we have to be a bit more careful on what we're conditioning on. <coughs> okay, so how about just translate one Portuguese word at a time? So then we can have really nice probabilities um, always the English word given the Portuguese word and hopefully we have seen all the Portuguese words somewhere or we know probabilities for them. So, um, so we translate eu into I and quero into want and so on and so on. And then we have translation probabilities associated with that. And to translate the whole sentence we just take the sentence that has the maximum um, probability. Um, okay. So uh, you already see in this sentence that might not work so well because we get I want here a presentation so that two in English doesn't seem to be that connected to any Portuguese word. And later there's actually some reordering with a very interesting following presentation in Portuguese while in English it's the other way around. So we have to deal with those things as well. So we need to move beyond just saying we translate one word at a time, so beyond this one-to-one -one alignment. And we also have to figure out where you get the probabilities from. Okay, so this is now hopefully sufficient motivation to introduce the very first statistical machine translation model um, that is very simple. Um, was proposed in the late 80s at IBM. Um, it gets taught in all classes at MT. Nobody actually uses it to do translation, but uh, introduces a lot of interesting concepts. Um, so where do we get the translations for words from? So we couldn't just look them up in, in a dictionary. So if I look up the German word house in a dictionary, it's gonna tell me that there are five different translations for it. House, building, home, household, shell. Uh, dictionaries also tend to list words by, by frequency. So the most frequent translation is house, the second most frequent is building. Um, in this case, shell is a very, very obscure translation of house. Um, it's really just used for the, how, the, the shell where a snail lives in. In German, that's called the house in Germany. In German, the, the snail carries its house around with it. Okay, so um, that's one way. Um, if we had a parallel corpus, so a large collection of translated texts, we could conceivably get some statistics out of that. So maybe the word house occurs in this corpus 10,000 times, and 8,000 times is translated as house, uh, building 1,600 times, home 200 times, household 150 times, shell 50 times. So based on that, we can um, do the standard simplest way to estimate probabilities by just taking the counts and divide by the total. This also has the fancy name, maximum likelihood estimation, because it's the most likely model that explains this data. Okay, um, so when we actually wanna move beyond words to sentences, um, I also want to introduce this concept of alignment a bit more clearly. So there's the idea that each word in the output is somehow connected to a word in the source. Um, so we basically give them word positions one, two, three, four, and we now gonna define a function that maps words from the English target word position to the German source word position. So in this case, it's a very simple function that just maps one to one, two to two, three to three, and four to four. 
Um, if you have reordering, like in this example, so in German you can also start the sentence here with the, with the adjective, Klein ist das Haus, and then you have a much more jumbled alignment. But you still have you know, a fairly decent alignment function that just now matches word number one to three and so on and so on. Okay, um, so that's all we need to come up with IBM Model 1. Um, so the core of that is actually just the product there on the right. So the idea is that model tries to explain every English word we produce, and we're going to explain each English word by um, what is it, the prob probability that it's a translation of a foreign word, and which foreign word, well, the one it's aligned to. So here's our alignment function, um, and that maps then the English words to a foreign word, and we can uh, go through all of that. Um, the stuff in front is just a normalization constant. It's not really needed for anything. Okay, so now we have a mathematical description of a model. Um, here's um, one worked out example of how you would use this if you would actually want to use this model to translate. So this house is Klein. We just have maybe these probability tables and we can pick any word out of the probability table. But ultimately we want to produce the most likely translation so we just take um, the word that has the highest probability and can multiply up all these numbers. Okay. So that's a, that sounds like a good plan. Um, so we need to estimate these translation probabilities from large amounts of translated text, um, so parallel corpus. But we have one minor piece missing, which is these alignments. So we, it's not hard to get millions and maybe even billions of words of translated text. It's incredibly hard to get anybody uh, to annotate uh, these texts with alignment links. Um, so that data basically doesn't exist. Um, there's maybe a few hundred sentences here and there. So if you want to build a large-scale system for Portuguese, um, there's really nothing I'm aware of that even exists. So, um, so we don't have the alignments. So we, ha we have a really funny uh, chicken-egg problem. So you need one of, this, one of the two things. You either need the alignments or you need a good probability distribution. So you, but you don't know. <laughs> and we don't have either. If you had the alignments, then it would be really straightforward to learn the translation probabilities. We just look at all the links, see which word is mapped how often to other words, and we get the probabilities out, and that's all we have to do. The other way around, if someone gives us the perfect model of saying house 80% to house and 50% to building, then we can go over each sentence pair and just figure out for each English word what's the most likely German word that it maps to, and we just this way then draw all these alignment links. But we don't have either of these two things. So this is where the EM algorithm comes to the rescue. I think Noah talked about that today. So here you have a practical uh, worked out example how you use that. So the idea is that you have incomplete data and if you had complete data you could estimate the model and if you had the model you could estimate uh, fill in the gaps in the data. So how does the EM algorithm do, does, do this? Well it starts with just coming up with a model. So in our case we're just saying at the beginning, we don't know anything. Any English word is equally likely translated into any Portuguese word. All the same probability. So it's not a very good model, but it is a model, so we can apply it to the data. And now suddenly, we have at least probability distributions over alignment links. And then we can pretend that that is real and collect uh, then statistics over it. And then we have a better model, and we keep going. So here's a kind of hand wavy illustration how this might work. So you have here very, very small uh, parallel corpus. We switched for, to French for general variety. Um, so at the beginning, we don't really know anything about the alignment links. But you already see that the word the and the word la is very often aligned. Um, so that's probably, you know, you see that three times. So that's probably something <coughs> that gives that some credence, so we're probably going to learn a model that thinks la and the are good translations of each other. So when you go around the second time with such a model that is already a little bit better, um, so now indicated by the strength of the alignment links, um, you would now think if I want to draw the perfect sentence alignment for the entire sentence, I'm probably going to start with aligning la to the and then see what I can do with the rest. Um, and if I keep doing this, um, for instance, 
you know, since the and la is already aligned, then flower should probably be aligned to fleur and and maison and house is the same example. So that's why we're then also going to figure out ultimately that uh, blue and blue are aligned to each other. So that's the hope. So this is kind of the magic trick that suddenly so supposedly is going to happen. Okay, so then we can estimate our probabilities. Um, so uh, for IBM Model 1, I'm going to go a little bit over actually working through that with the math. Um, so it consists of two steps, so expe expectation steps, where you apply the model to the data. So we basically have to compute uh, probabilities for all the possible alignments you can have for a sentence pair. And then a maximization step, where you just then pretend that these are the proper alignments and estimate counts <coughs> over it. Um, so we need to be able to compute two things, uh, the probability of alignments, and then do count collection. Um, so here's uh, the example uh, with just one sentence pair now, two word phrases, uh, how this actually might work out. So this is uh, at the top you see the model that we start with. It already has a bit of a bias that la and the is probably good translations and the maison not so good. Um, and then we come across the sentence pair where la maison is translated to the house. And there are um, four different configurations possible. Um, I skipped that over that a bit. Uh, we talked about an alignment function that maps English words to foreign words. So that means each English word has to go somewhere, but there's no restrictions on the foreign side. So they can all be mapped to the same word or to different words. So some words might not have any mapping at all. But each English word has to be connected to somewhere. And since you have two English words and each English word has two possibilities, there are four different configurations that are possible. Um, so we then can put in um, our IBM Model 1 formula. This is in the line just below it. So this just multiplies up the translation probabilities uh, for simplicity. So the the, la, and house, maison. So the first example is 0.7 times 0.8, so you get 0.56. So that's the probability for the sentence alignment. Um, and so you can compute them for all the other ones. So everything gets some probability mass, but most probability mass goes to the um, correct one. And then we, we are not really interested in the probability of the English given the foreign. We are interested in the probability of the alignment given the sentence pair. So we have to do a little bit mathematical gymnastics. In this case, we just, since they're all listed, it just basically means you normalize these probabilities so they add up to one. Um, and so I'm basically saying this first alignment pair, uh, this first way of aligning the sentence pair uh, we has 82% probability and then 5% and 11% and then less than 1%. And this is now um, how much we're going to weight the counts that we actually see in these annotations. So how much evidence do we have that the is a translation of la? Well, we see that in the very first example. And that first uh, example has 82% probability, so we put that in. And then in the second example, where it has 0 0.052 uh, probability. And we want to put that, uh, we count that as well. And you kind of see that uh, the right choices here get boosted by this example. Um, so we learning basically um, from this example that the model we had that mapped la to the is a pretty good model and applies here really well and therefore uh, gets reinforced. OK, so I'm now skipping over convergence proofs and all this kind of fun stuff um, and move on to another model. Um, also very much in the spirit of sequence modeling, the HMM model. Um, so the IBM model one that I just introduced, um, it, it actually used alignments to identify which word is mapped to which, but it didn't actually explicitly model alignment. So there's no way to say, for instance, in this model, it's better, knowing nothing else, but it's better to first translate the first word of the foreign sentence instead of the 10th word of the foreign sentence. Sentence. So there's no model that also guides the alignments just basically by kind of obvious word order. So we want to introduce that. 
So the HMM model has an alignment function that looks like this. So it aligns each English target word based on where the previous English target word was aligned to and the length of the output sentence. Um, uh, the input sentence, so this is how many <coughs> positions you could actually condition over. Um, okay, um, so this has the nice benefit that um, reordering often happens in large movements, so if you have a whole phrase reordered, you then more likely gonna pick up with the words there instead of just always jumping to the beginning. Um, so here's how this would work out now with all the, all the probabilities we have introduced. So we have these alignment links. So now some reason you linked up Cairo to two. That's probably a good thing to do. So function words are always extremely tricky to align. They don't really have one-to-one -one correspondences to a foreign language. Um, they're always more like uh, a glue that makes the language work and different languages differ. But if you translate a word like Cairo into English, um, you might just always want translate it to one, two. So you're going to pick that up and you're probably going to learn that Cairo not only produces the word want, but the word two. Okay, anyway, so we have all the, uh, all the probabilities there. So it starts with the translation probability, which just maps based on the word mapping. You know, how likely is IA translation of EU? Um, the alignment probability that I just introduced, saying how likely do I start with position one, translating the first word, given that the previous word was, you know, the beginning of sentence, so zero, and the, the foreign sentence has seven words. And then we also have the language model. Here's just a bigram language model, because I didn't have enough space on the slide. So what's the probability of starting the sentence with I? So this is a bit of a sketch. Um, um, this is actually not really how we do it. Um, there's also this idea of noisy channel model I didn't want to go into. So you actually flip around the translation probabilities. But that's more or less the spirit of the idea. Um, so we have a really nice kind of translation system. Um, we have a way to estimate these probabilities on data and can do translation pretty much as producing output sequence word by word. Okay, um, I'll now move about to a model that is not tied to words, but to phrases. Um, so the, the word-based models, the IBM Model 1, the HMM model I just talked about, uh, translate words as atomic units, and I already showed you one example where you kind of run into problems with the want to being a translation of Cairo. Um, while phrase-based models uh, translate phrases as atomic users. Um, so they have, they have the advantage of doing many-to-many -many translation, like care to want to, or really interesting, like long phrases. You know, European Union might have a really st standard translation, so you don't have to translate the words individually. So you can use local context in translation. Words are ambiguous, that's why we have probabilities. But if you look at the surrounding words, often the meaning of words becomes much, much clearer. So it's, for instance, easier to have a translation, phrase translation for things like interest rate or real estate, where each of the individual words is highly ambiguous. Interest means uh, it's the classic example for words and segregation, because it has these very clear different meanings. And rate is such a fuzzy word that the, whose meaning constantly changes, depends on context. But interest rate is a very, very clear concept and has a very, very clear translation. So if you model it on that level, you actually have it much, you get much more distinct translation probability distributions. Um, there's also the idea that the more data you have, the longer phrases you can learn, um, up to the point that if you've seen, if you've seen the sentence before, you can just map the entire sentence into the target. Um, so this is the standard statistical machine translation model that's been used for a decade now. It's pretty much still probably what, what's behind Google Translate, and that's kind of the system we work with most of the time. Um, so here is the one slide description <coughs> of what it is. So now we're gonna break up the source sentence into phrases, and these phrases are not linguistic phrases, so they're not noun phrases or verb phrases, they're just basically n-grams. And we have a one-to-one -one correspondence of these phrases uh, from the foreign language into English. So, that's it. It really fits on a slide. It's very easy. Um, 
So, so you might have uh, then probability distributions like this. So the core behind this is then the phrase translation table. So here, possible translations are natürlich. So it might be 50% of course, or 30% naturally, or of course, as one of these words that typically interjected in the middle of an English sentence. So there might be some commas. Maybe you put it at the beginning, and it has only one comma. Or you put it in the middle of a sentence, and it has a comma before and after. And that can be all part of your translation table. Um, here's actually a real translation table entry for a word that is trained on the European Parliament corpus. So that's a fairly nice large corpus that exists for many languages. It uh, has about 50 million words in it. So it's a good chunk of data. Um, and here are the top translations for Dean Vorschlag. So it's the proposal, then this split off genitive marker, someone's proposal, a proposal, and then you also get some different word choices for the content word, the idea, you have later the suggestions, and so on. One interesting thing is uh, you also get the word it, because that's just how you know, translated data sometimes looks like. So you have a translator translating an entire document, and the German translator decided, or the author, I don't know what the original is, let's say the German author decided to write uh, Dean Vorschlag again, and the English translator decided, we know what we're talking about. Let's just use it. So what do we get out of it? We get this alignment for the Vorschlag to it. So that's not a good thing. Uh, typically, uh, the, that noise kind of is at the kind of tail end distribution. So it doesn't really have much impact on the functioning of these mounts. OK, so we want to learn these tables from parallel data, as we before. And you're going to do this in two stages, or three stages, says here. Um, so there is the word alignment. For that, we actually use the models we just introduced. So that's the main reason why these IBM models and HMM models are still around is because they're, they're really good to just do word alignment. So all you need is a parallel corpus split up into words. You can run these algorithms, and you get a word aligned parallel corpus, which is useful for estimating other models or anything you want to do with it, projection of linguistic annotation and so on. OK, so we use the, uh, these IBM models uh, for word alignment. And then we extract phrase pairs. And then we have to figure out how to score them. Um, so if this is now here a sentence pair um, where a filled out dot means the words are aligned, then uh, we can extract from that uh, phrase pairs like this. So we can draw boxes around, uh, larger boxes in there. And whatever words they touch, um, is then part of the phrase pair that we extract from it. So here's our rule how we do this. Basically, when you draw a box like this, all the words that this box touches have to have all the alignment points inside the box. So the first one is fine. So this two by three box captures all the alignment points. The second one is not fine because one of the alignment points is outside the box. You can't just use the top left two by two square. And then there's some ambiguity what to do with words that don't actually have any alignment. And we basically say they can go anywhere. So we can have this three by three box as well, because the third word um, in the third co uh, column has no alignment point. OK. So if you have a sentence pair like this, you can extract the really, really small phrases. And you can extract also really, really long phrases. So these are now all the phrases you can extract from it. And one thing you notice is that you can extract actually much more phrase pairs out of it than the original sentence was long. So often these phrase tables are even bigger than the original parallel corpus you start with. Um, so they're gigabytes uh, on disk. Um, that 10 years ago was a bit of a problem. Nowadays, you just have big enough disks, so it doesn't matter. OK, um, the last thing you have to do is, once we collected all these, how to score them. And we just do rather simple things like, conditional probabilities uh, based on counts. So that's a good old maximum likelihood estimation. It usually helps to also have as a back of uh, word translation probabilities in there, because this kind of falls apart if a phrase has been seen only once, then its only translation that it's been seen with has 100%, and that's a bit uh, overestimating things. OK. so. Next thing we have to do is uh, actually do a translation with these models. So this is a, also a great application of how do you um, kind of uh, search through uh, 
the space of all possible sequences that can be used, uh, that you can produce from a source sentence and, and do this efficiently and quickly. Um, so the, go the, the goal of a decoding is to find the most probable translation, not to find the best translation. So there's an important distinction to be made. Um, the translation system might produce really rubbish translations, either because we couldn't find the most probable translation or because the most probable translation is really bad. But if the most probable translation is really bad, that is not the problem of the decoder. The decoder has really only the goal to produce um, the most probable translation. So the way usually you evaluate decoders is not really by overall translation performance, but how, what probability, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the sentences are defined, what probability is assigned to them. It should find the highest probability sentences. Okay, so let's translate this uh, German sentence now into English. Uh, so we'll start at the beginning, let's say. Translate er into he, and then we're going to jump around a bit and translate ja nicht and does not, and then geht into go, and then the house into home. So that's kind of how you want to translate. So it looks very similar to the word translation example. So you also pick things out of the source sentence. Um, at the end, you have to have all the source words covered, and you produce the target sentence. OK, so here's the problem. There's a lot of entries in your phrase table to choose from. So for this little phrase, again, also with the Europal trained phrase table, you can actually have 2,727 uh, different phrase table entries you could apply here. Uh, I'm just showing here the top four for uh, some of the spans. So um, the, usually we don't use all, all the 2,700, uh, but let's say only consider the top 20 for each phrase. There's some words that have a massive amounts of possible translations. Um, it's usually the comma or the word the. <laughs> These just don't align well and they just pop out anywhere and then they get randomly assigned to something and you just learn massive amounts of translations for these. So um, one important thing is when you build these phrase tables, don't consider all the 100,000 translations for comma all the time. OK, uh, so the task is to pick here now the, the right phrases. So that's a bit of a challenge, obviously. And then also put them in the right order. Um, so we're going to do this uh, with heuristic search. So the, the idea is we start at the beginning. You have these boxes here that represent a partial translation. So this is just a totally empty partial translation. And when we now start to translate a word, let's say just for no good reason, we translate the word gate into R. Um, then we check off the second word. So that's why this little square is now filled. And we just take note that we produce the word R. And of course, we have several choices. Um, at this point, we can pretty much take any of these entries in the phrase table and just say, let's start with that. So if you leave it at 2,700, this already creates 2,700 choices. Um, well, after that, you can expand further. And if you draw it this way, this looks very much like an ex exponential process where each step uh, things just multiply. So it's, uh, the number of sequences you generate this way is more or less exponential with the length of the sentence. So that's not good. And it has actually been proven that this type of uh, decoding, uh, this, this kind of search problem is NP hard. So this is not really going to work for any realistically long sentences. OK, um, so what are we going to do about it? So we're going to do two things. Um, one is uh, we're going to make the search space a little bit more compact by doing recombination, which is uh, risk-free, so we're not losing anything uh, technique. And then we just finally just take the chainsaw to it and prune some stuff out that just clutters up the search space. So the idea of recombination is that there might be two different ways to reach basically the same point. Um, so let's say there's a phrase translation for um, uh, the first two words into it is, or you can translate the words separately, amounts to the same thing. We checked off the first two words, we produced the word it is. And the argument here is one of these has a higher score based on the probabilities we already factored in. And the one that has a lower score couldn't possibly be the best translation for the sentence. Um, 
because you could just pretty much switch out uh, it with a better choice and then that one has a higher score. So we can get rid of it. So sometimes we want to keep note of that there are different, two different ways to go there because then we have a nice search lattice that we can use for other purposes. Um, but in, for the purpose of finding the best translation, we really just use this to filter out uh, hypotheses. Okay, um, so it actually goes a bit further. So if you only have a trigram language model, then only really the last two English words matter. Um, so you can actually combine these two examples as well because um, they also cover exactly the same words um, and they match on the last two English words. So the last two English words still have an impact on the language model score for the word that's going to be attached afterwards. So that can be then combined as well. Okay, so that, uh, that's a nice idea. So that reduces the search space quite a bit, but not enough. So we if it would have been enough, we would have solved an NP complete problem. Um, so we have to do uh, pruning, meaning we've got to throw out things that just look bad. And that's risky because things that initially look at might actually be good afterwards. And we don't know that. And the only way to know it is to really then exhaustively translate everything. And we don't have the time for that. So here's the idea. So first we're going to organize all these hypotheses into stacks. Um, um, so we uh, put all the hypotheses that have one word translated in one stack, all the hypotheses that have two words translated in another stack, and all the words that have three words translated that are stacked. And then you can already see how you actually then do decoding with these. So you're going to start by putting the empty hypothesis in the first stack and expand from there. That fills up things and stacks down the road. Then he goes through to stack number one, go through all the hypotheses, expand them in all possible ways, and uh, fill out, fill up uh, stacks then also further down. <coughs> um, so if these stacks get to full, they get to full, we're just gonna look at the scores they have and keep the 100 best or 200 best or whatever. Um, there's typically another wrinkle by uh, taking into account which words they're translated and estimate that we only translate the easy words or the hard words and uh, account for that. Uh, but otherwise, that's pretty much it. So if you look at this, this is then the entire decoding algorithm. So we, we, pi we place the empty hypothesis in the stack zero, and then we move through all the stacks and look at all the hypotheses in the stack. We look at all the translation options. We check, can that translation option be applied to it, and if yes, then we have a new hypothesis, and we put it in a new stack. And that's pretty much it. So we can do then recombination and pruning if the stack is too big. That's it. So it shouldn't be hard to write a decoder like this. I think there's even implementations in JavaScript uh, for MT class and teaching. You can try that out. OK, um, yeah, pruning, I want to say it just a little bit. Um, there's various ways to do it. it it really works out best to just say we're going to keep the top 100. You could also just do it based on the probability. So just say if, they don't, if they're not like 10 times worse than the best one, we keep it. But that number is a bit hard to adjust. So it's really easier to just say we're going to keep the top 100. If you do this, um, you reduce the complexity of decoding pretty substantially to just uh, quadratic complexity. If you do one more thing, which we typically also do, which is we limit reordering to a sh smaller window. So let's say we can reorder more than six words. Uh, we can jump over more than six words. Then this essentially becomes a linear complexity. OK, um, how we this is now optional part of how we have time. Oh, oh no, that's not the right time. What's the time? It's, uh, OK. Um, OK, so I'm just going to go very quickly about this one. So this is the operation sequence model. It's the idea to rephrase what I just described um, in a different way. So the big problem with these phrase-based models is this phrase segmentation you do, which is somewhat arbitrary. So you never know, should you lose big phrases and short phrases? Um, and even if there are two different ways to break things up, which one is the right one? Maybe you have really good translations for Spaß am or am Spiel and you, you have, you're forced to choose one of them. So, so the idea now is to, to break up these phrase translations into smaller steps and then uh, model both the mapping of uh, minimal phrase translations 
and reordering in a, in, a, in a process. So you have a bunch of operations. These operations are either translation operations or reordering operations. And then you model the whole thing as a sequence. So you have a whole um, sequence of what's the probability of the first operation, what's the probability of the second operation. So this does then, um, and we use standard language modeling techniques there to do smoothing and back off. So this is none, then a nice method that uses always as much context as it can and uh, basically just things like overlapping phrases, uh, which we couldn't do before. Okay, so um, moving on. Um, I don't know how many linguists are in the house, but if they are, they probably have been screaming at me internally for a while. <laughs> um, so uh, really, is language a sequence of words? Isn't, are we really taught that? Um, so different languages have very, very different word order. So just saying we just she did the sequence task is already tricky because we have to jump around a lot. And one big thing we know about language is the language is recursive, so you can always put things inside other things. You know, you can have a sentence and then you put an adjective phrase in there and you put another relative clause in there and you can build very, very nested constructions. So you really should be using a tree formalism. That's what linguists do. Uh, because ultimately, we don't translate words, we translate the meaning. So here's the grand vision of what we should be really doing, which is mapping the source sentence into a language-independent meaning representation, and then having that meaning representation generate uh, the target sentence. Um, so we don't have any good idea how this meaning representation looks like, so we don't really do that. But at least we can get closer to that. We can, instead of just doing lexical transfer by mapping words, we can do a syntactic transfer where we just say, we first generate the parse tree and then we order the parse tree. Or we do some somewhat more semantic annotations where we maybe look at uh, uh, a predicate argument structure, the efforts on the way to do, have meaning representations. Um, to be used for machine translation. Um, if you actually do this, uh, the way this uh, triangle is, is drawn, um, it implies also that the transfer process gets easier. So um, if you translate, for instance, German into English, the reorderings often look really, really messy. But if you draw a syntax tree, these syntax trees are fairly, uh, they're much more isomorphic. They much, look much more similar to each other. Uh, so the big kind of verb reordering that causes all kinds of havoc then just looks like a flip in one of the rules you apply. Okay, so quick introduction for the non-linguistic linguists. So there's phrase structure grammar. Uh, so there's the idea that there are things like noun phrases, the big man, a house, prepositional phrases, verb phrases, adjective phrases, and you can then formalize the grammar by writing a con uh, uh, writing it down as a context-free grammar. So you have rules that either produce um, um, words or that produce other sequences of these uh, phrase structure labels. So for instance, a noun phrase can be a determiner and a noun. So here's how this looks like for an English sentence. I shall be passing on to you some comments, a bit of a convoluted sentence, but that's how the parse tree looks like, at least according to when you run through Collins parser. Um, so what we, re what we can do with that, if we have these things, is we can have uh, rules like this. So in English, uh, the noun phrase is built by determiner, adjective, noun, but in French, it's determiner, noun, adjective. So then we want to have, combine these two rules and have a synchronous rule. So there's a rule that builds both a French tree with a French sentence and an English tree with an English sentence. And this rule basically encapsulates the fact that whenever you produce a French uh, noun phrase with an adjective, that that adjective gets reordered. Um, so you can have, the kind of rules we have can be rules like this. So these are non purely non-terminal rules. They can be just terminal rules that look exactly like phrase pairs as that we had before, or they can even be mixed rules. So typically, uh, grammar writers don't do that for our models. We use those kind of rules. So we just say, la maison, adjec adjective goes to the adjective house, and that adjective can be anything. <laughs> um, so we basically then have a nice mechanism that explains a sentence pair by application of a certain number of rules, and then the, the translation probability 
um, is based on the probabilities you assign to these rules. Um, let me just quickly go. Uh, so uh, you do the estimation of these rules as before, where you just take a parallel corpus, run word alignment first, then extract all these rule fragments. So here is uh, a way to illustrate the, the minimal rules that can be extracted from a sentence pair where one side is parsed in syntactic, uh, uh, into a syntactic parse tree. So the idea is basically that for each node in the parse tree, you may or may not be able to extract one rule. And that's then the rules you go with. And when you decode, we now suddenly don't do sequence modeling anymore. Uh, we have to build things bottom up. So, uh, so this is a German sentence, sie will eine Tasse Kaffee trinken. Um, so that means word by word translated, she wants a cup coffee drink. So that's how Germans talk. And uh, we start at the bottom, see if we can translate any individual words. So maybe she, that becomes a pronoun. And coffee is a noun. And drink is a verb. And then we have larger rules. This is now a mix of non-terminals and terminals in there that uh, translate eine Kaffee, eine Tasse, noun, into a cup of noun, and that noun could be anything. Since we already have a translation for the noun produced, we can now apply this rule on top of that. Um, so if you've done any natural language processing class, this will be known to you as chart parsing, and uh, the, it is essentially chart parsing what we're doing here. It only gets slightly more complicated by the fact that we also translate and not just build a parse tree. So you, because we essentially build an English parse tree on top of a German sentence. So we just, whenever we replace words, we get English words. But we're basically building an English parse tree on top of a German sentence. OK, so this is kind of the space uh, that you have to fill. So there are all these possible spans uh, that can be filled with constituents. Um, and you basically process this bottom up. And uh, that way, you can then figure out on the top what is the best uh, what's the best uh, constellation to explain an entire sentence. OK, so these models um, have been proven to work really well for, for German and Chinese. Uh, so they were first developed for Chinese, and they're pretty much the last time there were big competition run where the state of the art for Chinese. Uh, we worked on that a lot for German. And uh, they were start state of the art for a while um, before something else came. Um, Decoding is a bit more complex and slower, so you can't do the trick to reduce it to linear speed to that degree. Um, so that's, that's a drawback. Another big drawback is that it does require that you have a syntactic parser on either the source side or the target side or both. Uh, and you also probably have to do a little bit hand-holding for each language pair, like what kind of types of rules you allow and what kind of labels you use. OK. So that was trees. That was the right thing to do. So if you, if you head towards more linguistic machine translation, that's the first stepping stone. The next stepping stone was to do semantic representations, and there are people working on that. So let me uh, defend a little bit why sequence models might not be a bad thing to do. So one interesting fact is that when you study how humans do translation, they don't seem to kind of process sentence bottom up. They seem to be very much doing it left to right. Um, so we had a European project on building a tool for translators called Kasmakat. Um, if you're interested in that, you should definitely check it out, um, where we tracked uh, the keystrokes of, keystrokes of translators and also the eye movement of translators. And we have pretty solid evidence that a lot of translators kind of read the first four or five words of a source sentence and then already start typing the translation. So they seem to be doing left to right. They're taught in translation school, no first read the entire document, blah, blah, blah. But the more experience they get, the less they do this. So they just, um, and it's, you know, if you come across the first words, you kind of already know where to start. You might run the trouble in the middle of the sentence where it doesn't actually go where I thought it would go, so I have to rewrite something. But why waste time reading the entire source sentence? So this is a bit of a plot of eye tracking data we have. Um, okay. So here's another argument. Yeah, we don't have to give up on syntax just because we want to do left to right. So you can also do parsing in a left to right fashion by doing, uh, using a push down automaton. So we just say the word the is, gets parsed. OK, that's a determiner. 
Then we move to interesting. We look up that part of speech tag is an adjective. Then we go to lecture. That's a noun. And then we can apply a rule saying whenever you have determine an adjective noun, that can become a noun phrase, so you replace that. Then you go to the next word, look up its part of speech tag. It's a verb. And then you look up the part of speech tag of the last word. That's um, an adverb. And you can apply then rules. And if you apply them, you also get this parsed as a sentence. So you don't have to do um, this bottom-up decoding if you want to do uh, if you want to use syntax. Um, nobody really does this for MT, and I'm not entirely sure why. So there's some serious problems with the bottom-up decoding um, that makes it computationally really hard. So maybe this, to, if you can do a syntax for the left or right fashion, uh, make that work for for MT, that would be really helpful. Okay, so I said uh, there's one thing that now seems to be the state of the art, and that's neural models. So I'm, uh, the, at the end of this, later this week, there's going to be long lectures about how neural networks work and deep learning and all that. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a glimpse how that is being applied to MT. So here's the one slide summary of what a neural network is. So you, the point is that you use a lot of real-valued vector representations for things. Um, and that you have then multiple layers of computation. And there's a lot of benefit to having multiple layers of computations. Um, so uh, when you heard about linear classifiers, uh, you might have heard that there's very simple functions like XOR can't be modeled with a linear classifier. So a linear classifier draws a line through their space. If you have XOR, where you have 0, 0, 1, 1, you can't draw a single line through that space. But if you just have a, a neural network like this, you can very easily uh, uh, learn XOR functions. Um, and the last thing is, yeah, the nonlinear functions. Um, so the, the whole craze about deep learning these days is to have more and more of these layers. Um, that's why they're called deep. Um, so I said everything is represented by big vectors. So this is here vector representations of words. These are called word embeddings. It's a bit large. Let's zoom in a bit. And uh, that excites currently everybody in natural language processing. So you can look at this and stare at this and say, like, scoring and playing, they get almost, you know, they get very close to each other in this representation space. This is great. And uh, um, uh, it seems to be doing all the right thing. It kind of learns semantics. So some people then also claim that this is actually the meaning or representation of words. So you might think the meaning of house is something really, really occult or bizarre or mystic, but it's really just a 500 dimensional vector with real numbers in it. OK, so why we do neural machine translation? So, so the nice thing about word embeddings, as I just showed you, is that you could learn from similar examples. So you see something with house, and then you see the word. Uh, this, you have to translate something where the word building comes in, and this model somehow tells you that house and building are very similar, so you can actually maybe reuse some of that translation knowledge from similar examples. Um, they make it also very easy to condition on a lot of context without having to deal with really tricky back-off schemes. And there may be something to nonlinearity. I'm not entirely sure <laughs> if there's some real benefit in having these more complex computations in there. Um, so let's just start with a language model. So this is an n-gram language model, and we just put in as inputs to our neural network the four words of context, and we try to predict the, the other word. So this is. Um, pretty straightforward neural network architecture. It's kind of like the earlier picture, except now filled in with some context. So that's one thing to do. Uh, what seems to be more popular nowadays is, is to do recurrent neural networks, where you kind of step through things uh, one step at a time. So we're really in sequence modeling space now. Um, so you start with the first word and try to predict the second word. And while you do this computation, you have this hidden layer in the middle, and you just copy that over and use that then to predict uh, the third word, and so on and so on. So you kind of tie up these predictions one word at a time. Um, so this is, a, in terms of number of parameters, actually a simpler model than the earlier one. So how can you do machine translation with that? So here's a crazy idea. Why don't we just view it as language modeling, or as like a big long sequence modeling, where you first go through the foreign sentence, and then go through the English sentence? Because then we condition each English word somehow on all the previous 
foreign words. So this, uh, this is pretty much all there is. So you kind of do what I just explained for language modeling, you just do this for the entire translation process. So there are people that claim that this works, yeah. <laughs> respectable people. I don't quite see how it can work, especially for long sentences. If you have a 50 word sentence, how it could possibly then remember enough about the input sentence in a hidden state to produce that output, but okay. Um, so what's, what's slightly more popular, uh, but what's now basically the standard uh, approach to this is to uh, kind of uh, remember what I said at the very beginning of the lecture. We maybe should have an alignment function in there. So here's a rather complicated chart of the attention model that has such an alignment mechanism. I'm not sure if I should go through all these colors. But the idea is that you have the input word embeddings uh, before you do that and use this to uh, have a bit of a richer annotation of the input by having recurrent neural networks running left and right so that kind of then has a representation for each word in its context with its left context and with its right context. Um, you then have an alignment uh, representation that basically says I should pay attention to the first two or three words but not to the other ones. So when you then condition on the source sentence, you condition on a, on a subset of that source sentence. Um, so it's basically an alignment function you learn. And then on the output you do what we did before, that you just kind of produce these hidden states in each, each time you output a word. Okay, let me finish up with some practical matters um, where things are. Uh, so enough modeling and math. Um, so the first question you probably had is, how good is MT? So here is a, a sentence I got out of a Portuguese newspaper about the Celestial Portuguesa, the football. Apparently they won some games or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so here's, uh, so here's the translation of that. Um, so if you, if you spotted it, you see here some examples. This is a really good translation. Like from, from like where MT is, Portuguese is the easier, Portuguese English is the easy language uh, because they're very similar word order uh, and so on. And so you get a few errors. So, so the Portuguese national soccer team, which won on Sunday for the first time European champions. So the one is not really wrong and the European champions is not really wrong, although it Campeão Europeu it's probably European Championship, or I'm not sure. European yeah, so that, that gets a, some of the stake is really then the champions. Anyway, these two things don't match up. And then was received today in euphoria. That's not really right there, with euphoria or something like this, and so on. And then the plain Eusebius, who was escorted. You can see this is a typical, like where you get like language model effects because you have Eusebius, which is a name of a person, and then you like who better than which, so you forget that it's actually a plane, and so on. Um, but this is a pretty good stuff. So machine translation, uh, so I like to say it's not perfect, it's useful for many things, so this is obviously fairly useful. Um, if I just want to read, read the Portuguese news, I can probably read that very good with MT. Um, it might be good enough to give that as a draft to translate as we can then just fix up the errors. That is happening a lot nowadays um, in the translation industry um, and so on. Okay, uh, the other question is from all the models I talked about what works best. Uh, what I didn't talk about is rule-based models. So this is kind of the old school non-statistical way of just writing, collecting big dictionaries by hand, writing translation rules by hand. Um, so that's the one we were competing with at the beginning. And uh, so these are uh, winners in a competition we stage every year um, um, where research teams participate, but we also use off-the-shelf systems, we use also Google Translate and anything we can get our hands on also submitted just to see where we are. So for English, German, the rule-based systems were holding out for the longest time. So up until three years ago, the best systems were actually rule-based systems for English, German. Um, that's not true for many, most of the other language pairs. So for most of the other language pairs, the statistical systems were already better 10 years ago. So they, did, they were holding out for a while. Then the phrase-based system that I talked about and said this is kind of the standard thing to do, um, that dominated the field for a long time. Uh, so for the syntax system that I talked about, we were managed to kind of beat finally the phrase-based system uh, 
two, one or two times. And now the new thing seems to be uh, the neural MT systems that, that had really good performance this year. So if you want to learn more about this, there's a conference in Berlin early April, early, early August where all this is going to be discussed. Okay, um, I, uh, if you're interested in this stuff, uh, there's a lot of open source software. So this is a very friendly field. We give you all the data, we give you all the software. You can actually build kind of a state-of-the-art system on your own computer. Um, so the implementation of all the statistical stuff I talked about um, is in a toolkit called Moses that we've been developing since, yeah, now 10 years. Um, there's a website, extend, really long manuals, there's a mailing list and so on. Um, and this, uh, if you're interested in neural machine translation, there's a lot of, this is relatively new, so things kind of change all the time. Um, but that's a toolkit you can use, um, which seems to be working really well and not too hard to install. Um, the one draw, big drawback for the neural systems is you, need, you definitely need to have a GPU to run this on and you need patience because even with the GPU, these things run easily two weeks, three weeks. Okay, uh, if you're more interested, I know I'm selling my wares here. I wrote a textbook, so it's still, it's actually now uh, five years old or six years old, but still pretty much, I mean, it teaches kind of the core methods that's still up to date. Uh, the one thing it was, didn't foresee was neural network models. So I wrote a chapter for some future second edition. Don't hold your breath. Um, uh, but you can get that chapter from that link here. And that's it. Yeah, it's working. So thank you for a very interesting talk. Are there any questions? There's one question there. Can you yeah, make a question? Question. One is, all the examples in your slide were from European languages. So what about really different languages with reaching flag? Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything better than blue scoring? Okay. Oh, I don't want to talk about evaluation. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so yeah, so it, so there are some really morphologically rich languages, even in European, like Finnish and Turkish. So we in the competition I just mentioned, we actually had Turkish this year as an example. Um, in the U U.S., the funding was mostly for languages like Arabic and Chinese. They're very excited about those languages for some reason. Um, and you can see, for instance, so. Rich morphology is definitely a real problem. Um, not so much actually in the input side because you can just take kind of like, uh, like a Finnish word that is like a whole noun phrase and you just chop it up into pieces and then translate the pieces. Um, it's harder on the t if you translate into these languages and have to kind of reconstruct morphologically coherent uh, output. So translating into Finnish, translating into Turkish is a real struggle. Um, and then the other issue was distant languages. So the, the, the other ling language I mentioned, Chinese, which has seen a lot of work. Um, there's also a lot of uh, statistical machine translation groups in China that work on Chinese. And there you really see that these are just fairly distant languages. So Chinese has the problem that they don't deal with nonsense like determiners and plurals and <laughs> all these things you don't really need. So it's often a bit hard to decipher what the sentence means, or it's, it's definitely hard for the MT system to figure out what are the right you know, determiner here. Is it A or the, or is it single or plural? Which for a human might be really clear out of context, but it's hard for a machine translation system too. And you also have the problem that just some of the concepts don't really match up so well one to one, that you just have certain concepts in a language that you just don't really have a word for in the other language, or not to that point. Um, so that, we did once a study where we tried to come up with characteristics like morphological richness of the language, distance in the language family, and try to use that to determine how good the translation quality is going to be if you just build a standard system. And the biggest problems were um, target side morphology, amount of reordering, and just general distance of the language. Um, interesting source side morphology didn't seem to matter all that much. Any further questions? There's one there. Oh. Yeah. There. 
Um, so it's it's basically the, the so the people who worked on syntax-based system always then only worked on one language pair. So the so we, we I did a lot of work on on uh, so the earlier work was done at uh, ISI and they worked on Chinese and they got it to work on Chinese really well. Um, so we've been working on German. We got it after years working for German really well. Um, so what you say about the yes so an abstract syntax sounds great. But in practice, you're going to run a parser that has a parsing accuracy of 80%, 90% on noisy data, and everything can go wrong. So you have noisy parsers, noisy word alignments. And uh, so for instance, the, uh, so we only build systems that have syntax on the target side. So the idea is that it forces us to build grammatically coherent sentences. And it, it does that more than phrase-based systems. But we don't go to the point of also using syntax as a source side and then have fully kind of uh, annotated uh, rules that are basically mapping noun phrases in the source to a preposition phrase and tag. That's where you, you don't have as much you know, similar looking trees. And it's also not just the, the nature of the languages, but also the way they constructed the tree banks might have different philosophies. Some might be flatter, some might be deeper. So yeah, the, the quality of the tools and the error of the tools is definitely a problem. So I guess there's a question there. Uh, yeah, the I have one, one more question. Um, how well do the attention translation models actually deal with many-to-one or one-to-many alignments? Um, they do. Uh, they, they seem to be doing this really well. I mean, they 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 also have a so this attention mechanism is a probabilistic <laughs> attention mechanism. So it gives then like eighty percent probability mass for the first word and twenty percent probability mass for the second word. And what that is actually then means is that you take the the representation of the first word and the reputation of the second word and just multiply the one with 0.8 and the one, other one with 0.2 and then add it up. Um, sounds a bit crazy, but it seems to be working. So you can, so it's not hard to condition on like phrases or longer context in the source. And on the target side, well, you do produce one word at a time, but you also have the kind of the language model in there. So you can produce phrases. Okay. So they don't seem to be struggling with many too many. They, so the, where they fall apart is often that they drop stuff because the attention mechanism is not smart enough to keep track of coverage. And, and if you don't train it long enough, they just happily produce English, stuff, English output, which has absolutely nothing to do with the input sentence. And it's because it just likes to produce one English word after the other. It's the first thing it learns. And it only later figures out that it has to look at the source sentence as well. Okay. Okay, thank you. Oh, one more? One more. Uh, could you say something more for, say, uh, two more. bidirectional uh, scenario address, like bidirectional response, maybe? Uh, I mean, uh, in comparison to, uh, to attention. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so when I draw this here, um, so the, there might actually be, so I just say they are current neural networks, so there might be more complicated things like LSTMs and, and or gated recurrent units or whatever they have these days. There seems to be new stuff coming up all the time. So, um, so that's definitely already in these models. Um, not quite sure what uh, you mean I, by, I mean by directional LSTM. I mean that uh, uh, if you um, let in the sequence like from the end, uh, from the beginning to the end, and uh, then from the uh, end to the beginning, yeah, and yeah. summing this up. It's that's actually the yeah. That's actually the two. Oh, that's why I there see. are two green rows. Mm -hmm. So one is left to right recurrent, and the other one is the right to left recurrent. Okay. One Thank last you. question here. Yes. Yeah. He was the first. Oh, sorry. Um, is uh, the size of the parallel corpora a huge problem for moving forward? Uh, the lack of it, or the, if you have too much, or what is oh, it called? <laughs> um, so, uh, so the good news is we have generally seen the more data you have, the better this stuff gets. So we, we're definitely not exhausting the data that's out there. Um, and that's true even for language modeling. 
So uh, that's why we have like the most, it's the easiest to get is a lot, lots of monolingual text. Um, so we even built uh, language models on a trillion words of English, which is slightly insane because then you need a machine with like terabytes. Um, and you see gains out of this. So uh, yeah, we would like to have more data. Um, I'm not entirely, so, so the amount of data we have typically for the, the high resource languages in the order of hundreds of millions, if not billions of words. So that's quite a lot. Um. Yeah. And you presented uh, two methods to do word alignment. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if there, you could compare the advantages of using IBM to HMM or what could be applications. Yeah. So they're typically then uh, stacked on top of each other. You first do the IBM model one for a few iterations and don't run into conversions and then you run the HMM on top of that. So the IBM one is just very simple. It just learns very few parameters and can, and you can actually have a closed form solution to all these things. Um, so yeah, but having a better model like HMM gives you a better quality and, and the alignment. Also compared to other IBM models? Yeah, so there's, there's, this, there's a kind of a sequence. So I'm, HMM kind of falls in between. It, so it takes some ideas from IBM Model 3 and IBM Model 2. Um, um, so the one thing that these IBM models do in addition to alignment function is a fertility function that predicts for each word how many and into how many words it translates to. So for most words, they translate into one word, some words translate into two words. So that gives a bit of a bias to avoid that one word eats up kind of the half the sentence. Um, and that's pretty much it. So the, the HMM and the IBM models are not that different. Okay, uh, do you have a question too? No, no sorry. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again.